Maybe the best part of today is I get to share my, my hobby, I guess my passion, with a, a fairly full room full of others who I hope ha at least share part of my passion for, for music, musical instruments, and also especially the piano. So what I want to do today is are sort of two things. First of all, I want to talk to you about some of, the, some of the history of the piano, some of the ins and outs of how pianos function, and how we listen to them, and so on. I also want to, to criticize physicists, which I almost never do, but, but I, as you'll see as I go through this talk, some of, our, some of the paradigms we use in physics about simplifying things and treating things, you know, there's this famous quote of Einstein, make every problem as simple as possible, but no simpler. Well, sometimes physicists go a little overboard in that, especially with regards, as we'll see, to a musical instrument like the piano. So that will be kind of a, an underlying theme, which I think which you'll see come over back several times through this talk. So what I'm going to do is begin by giving you a very general introduction to the piano. Uh, its overall structure, I'll remind you about how the strings and the soundboard and the hammers and so on are all connected to make this, this instrument. The piano is, is in some ways unique in that we know ex exactly when it was invented and we know why it was invented. Unlike instruments like, well, the organ or the, uh, or the violin where we don't quite know who, who started it first and, and some of it. For the piano, we know exactly who, start, who, who made the first pianos and we know why he made them. And that's an important part of the story I'll talk about. Then I'll move on and talk about some interesting aspects of, the, of piano acoustics. And here's where I'll show you, it's not just the simple physics that we learn in Physics 1. Simple physics can get us a long way, but it can't get us all the way to a real musical instrument, the one that we're used to listening to. That is a, a piano that was only based on the simple physics wouldn't be a satisfying piano. But we'll see how to make a satisfying piano as we go. So some of those aspects include inharmonicities of piano tones. They aren't quite harmonic as we're used to learning in Physics 1. We'll talk about how a piano tone changes with loudness and why that's extremely important for the instrument. I'll also talk about the variations of how piano tones vary with time, how, the, how their time decay, how it behaves, and why it's interesting. And uh, a little bit about bass notes and, and a psychoacoustic issue known as the missing fundamental, something that was first noticed by a physicist called Helmholtz, who you may have heard of. And I'll also talk in general about the importance of psychoacoustics. The way we listen to, to piano tones and music in general affects the way the piano was structured and is, is, is put together. And then I, I, I will, I'll run out of time. I won't get to talk too much about my own work and modeling of various parts of the piano. And then I'll wrap up by reminding you the, the main messages, what we really learn about from this kind of work. So this is a picture of a typical grand piano. This one sits in my living room. It's, just, it's, a, it's a modern, well, modern. It's about a 100-year-old Steinway. Uh, but it's, and, and for the purposes of this talk, I'll show lots of photos of this, of this instrument. Uh, these photos are in my, my book. I think this one was lifted to the, for the poster. And I should give my daughter credit. She's a photographer and she took, took all the, almost all the photos here. She did a wonderful job. Um, so this is a typical modern grand piano. Uh, you know, the, the player stands here at the front and pr puts on the key, presses on the keys. The strings run from front, front to back, and we'll talk more about that later. And the hammers, if you look inside the hammers, you push on these key levers in the front, and the hammers come up and hit the strings from below and then fall back. So the strings get hit from below, and they vibrate in a horizontal plane that runs away from the, the player. Okay? That's the general structure. You probably all, all knew that. So I'm sure you've all taken apart your piano at one time or another. Now, that's a modern grand piano. It has, about, it has 88 keys, 88 notes. This is the, is the oldest extant piano. Uh, it was made around 1720. It was made in Florence, Italy. It's interesting that this, that Christo, this is Bartolomeo Cristofori. He's the, the inventor of this instrument, of this piano, of this instrument. It's interesting that his, his, uh, he, he lived, his, he, he overlapped with a, a violin maker named Stradivari, who you may have heard of. And Florence isn't too far from Stradivari's hometown, and also in northern Italy. Okay? So this was a, must have been a really fascinating and very very exciting place to, to live at that time, especially culturally. Now, this is the only known uh, image of Cristofori. In fact, this image now, this, this painting no longer exists. It was destroyed in World War II in bombing of, of Germany. But the image persists. And the reason I showed it here is that Cristofori is holding in his hand, if you blow this up, you can see there's a piece of paper here, he's holding it. This is a diagram of a key part of the piano. Now, this is his first piano. I mentioned that the modern piano has 88 keys. This one has 49. 
okay, almost half the number. And it's really it has a lot in common with the harpsichord, but but mainly, but it's a it's a very different, rather different instrument than today. But the main, the key part of this instrument is is a, is the the mechanical piece that links the hammer, the the key levers to the hammers. As we'll see, an important part of this is that when you push on a piano key, you start the hammer in motion, and just before the hammer hits the strings, the key lever escapes, or the hammer escapes from the key lever. It's called an escapement. So the hammer is moving freely as it hits the string and is able to bounce back freely. That's a, a, an absolutely crucial part of the piano. This is the diagram of, of the mechanical lever system that Christopher invented. The fact that it's in this portrait shows that he knew exactly how important that was for the instrument. So, okay, and I'll come back to that several times. So let's talk, let's talk about why, why did Christopher invent this piano? Why did he invent it? Well, the goal, does anybody here speak Italian? Okay, so you know what piano means. Piano, piano in, in, in Italian means soft. Okay, and in fact, the early pianos were actually called pianoforte. That, that was one of the terms that Cristofori used for his instrument. So piano means soft, and forte means loud. You know, from your musical training. So it's a it's a soft loud, but it was it's an instrument that can play loud and soft. Okay, now as you may not know, the at that at the time of the I mentioned the piano, the main uh, keyboard instruments were the organ, pipe organ existed, and the, the, and the harpsichord. And both of those instruments have a property in that if you press the key a little bit or a lot, you get the same amount of volume. The tone is the same whether you press it hard or soft. You, 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 can't, have, you, you can't get the expressive possibilities of playing loud and soft from note to note. And that's what people wanted. That's what Cristofori wanted. That's what people like later, a few years later Mozart wanted. They wanted, to, they wanted the expressive capabilities that come from being able to change your volume from, literally from note to note. Okay? I mean, with organs, you play a little bit, and you can reach in, and you can pull a lever maybe on some organs, and you can then get louder or change, it changes sound and things. But you can't change it from note to note. With the piano, you can because of this escapement mechanism that Cristofori invented. I mean, he added the idea of a hammer to strike the strings, and that came about... I think at the time from people playing with dulcimers. So people knew about hammers hitting strings from dulcimers, but they didn't know about the idea of using the key as a lever through some kind of linkage called the action, which I didn't really draw here, that to get the hammer into motion, but then the key falls away from the hammer, the action falls away from the hammer just before it hits the string. So the hammer is moving freely. If you push the key lever hard, it's going fast. If you push it a little bit, it's going soft. That's, that's, the, that's the crucial part of, the, of Christofori's invention. And as I said, he knew how important this was. So the rest of this drawing shows you a very simplified physics or physicist conception of, of a piano. It's only a single string. Of course, there are many more than one in the piano. But the idea is that you have a string stretched between two ends, two, held rigidly at two ends. You hit it with a hammer. You excite waves on the string. We know about standing waves from our physics, introductory physics courses. And those standing waves cause a force on this bridge, which is attached to a soundboard, that sets the soundboard into motion. It, that acts like a large speaker, and that produces a sound that we hear. A vibrating string by itself produces very little sound because it moves very little air. The soundboard is much larger. It's, 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 it's a meter or two or three in, across. That moves a lot of air, and you know big speakers can make a lot of sound. OK, so this seems to involve only very simple physics but let's, let's go on and see, what, see what's more here. OK, so let's compare Cristofori's piano to the modern piano, the Steinway, but it, any modern piano would, would do. Uh, there's a different te technology of the strings. We now have steel. Steel strings really weren't invented until about 1850, so they weren't available to Cristofori in 1720. He used mainly brass strings. Some pianos at that time used iron, but they're, uh, they're much different in composition and much different in strength, so that the pianos of his day were much lower tensions, almost an order of magnitude lower in tension than the modern piano. The modern hammers are covered with felt. I'll talk more about that later. His were different. Uh, let me focus on one thing here. As I, I mentioned, he, his piano had 49 notes, and modern ones have 88. So the, the lowest note nowadays on a piano goes down to, it's called, it's A0. It's the lowest key on the piano, the far left. And that's got a, a, low, a frequency of the fundamental of 27.5 hertz. The highest note, the far right, is a C. And that has a frequency of a of over, little over 4 kilohertz. Now, one, so obviously, the piano involved 
from four octaves to almost eight. Why did that happen? Well, it happened because people like Mozart, whose pianos had five octaves, and then people like Beethoven, who had six, and then Brahms, who had seven. And they wanted more and more notes. They wanted to be able to do more. So the question you might ask is, why do we stop at, at seven and a few oct octaves? Why not have more? We can put, I mean, I can reach farther. Why not? Well, the answer in this case has to do with the way we listen to, to, to musical tones. It turns out that if I were to, I can easily make a tone with a much lower frequency than this. I can make a tone that's 10 hertz. But when you listen to that 10 hertz tone, you would not hear a musical tone, but you hear a series of clicks. So basically, somewhere around 25 hertz or so is the lower limit of what we hear as a tone as opposed to a click. Right? If, you, if it was a 10 hertz click, it would be you know, clicking on off at, at 10, 10, 10 clicks per second. It wouldn't sound like a musical tone. So that wouldn't be very useful to Mozart or Brahms or, anyone, or even John Cage probably, okay? <laughs> so that explains why the piano range stopped expand, extend, extending to below this. Now somebody in the audience will be a smart aleck and say, well what about the Bosendorfers? They have extra keys at the low end. Okay? Well those keys really aren't used very much and I'll come back to what, why, they, why, they might, why they, I think they are, they're a good thing a little later. So, Hold on to that question, or I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get back to that. Now, why about the highest note? Why not go to a higher frequency than this? As you may know, a young person, like most of the people in the audience, can hear about 20 kilo, up to about 20 kilohertz. Okay? I probably can. I don't know what my range is now. It's, I'm sure it's much less than that. As you get older, you know, your, ears can't, you know, your range, upper range, part of the range goes, away, or goes down. Well, the reason for that is even for a young person who can hear 20 kilohertz, the upper limit of what tones you can hear as a musical tone ends around 5 kilohertz or so. That is, as you probably know, or as we're talking about more, one of the nice things about musical tones is you play two together to play a, an interval or maybe you play a chord, and they sound good together because of the way chords and intervals are, are constructed frequency-wise relative to each other. But if I, if, I were to, so if I were to play, say, middle C is 262 hertz, and I were to play, say, a G above that or a C above that, I play them together, that sounds good. But if I were to play this C and then play the next G above that, you wouldn't be able to hear them <clears throat> in a musical, you wouldn't be able to hear their musical relationship. That is, you could tell that one note is higher than the other, pitch-wise, but you wouldn't be able to tell that they're a nice interval or not a nice interval. Your ability to perceive pitch in a musical way ends a little above this frequency. So again, notes above this I could easily make, I could put them on a piano, but they wouldn't be musically useful. So the way we listen to sound already has influenced how a piano has been constructed and designed. So this, and this has a, we'll see another example later of how the, human, the way humans listen to sound affects the way we perceive the sounds from a piano and other instruments. Okay, okay so what about, let's get back to the physics. <coughs> Now uh, that this picture does, it should, unfortunately it's not bigger, but the, the string on the far right, the high notes, the strings here are very short, as you probably know. The low end strings, the bass strings, are much longer. Okay? Now, if I, suppose I want to take, take a, I have a string, and I want to then make it, design another string to produce a note an octave, an octave lower. So I'm going to go from, say, the C right, uh, right here to a C an octave lower. Well, one way to do that would be to keep the string composition the same, keep the tension the same, and simply make the string twice as long. As you may know, again, from your physics, that if I double the length of the string, I double the, wave, I double the wavelength, which cuts the frequency in half. So I've made an octave, factor two difference in the pitch. So if I, if I keep doing that, I can, I can go from one C to an octave lower, to an octave lower, octave lower, I keep reducing the frequency by a factor of two. And, and this curve is just, a, is just a one over frequency curve, and that's called Pythagorean scaling. You may or may not know that Pythagoras is credited with, with having designed musical scales long ago. This is, it's the same Pythagoras who had, in his spare time, talked about right triangles. But he also is, is sort of re referred to as the father of musical scales, too. Um, but if I followed that kind of scaling for a piano, by the time I get down to the, the bottom end, I would be something like six meters long. Okay? That would be an awfully long piano. Okay? It, wouldn't, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't fit in my living room, at least not with my wife's uh, consent. Uh, so what do we do? Well, 
it, this, this dash curve shows the actual string lengths for this particular piano. So we follow this, this Pythagorean curve pretty well, just a little bit below middle C, that's C4, and then it be, sort of saturates. So what, what's going on here? Why, what, how, how are you able to saturate? How can this string, which is, which is far shorter than you might have expected, produce such a low, a low uh, note? And the answer is that another way to make a string vibrate at a lower frequency is to make it heavier, to increase its mass per unit length. And, the way, and so one way to do that would be just to make it thicker. I could take my piano string. Around middle C, the piano strings are about a millimeter in diameter. So they're somewhat thin piece of steel. But if I make it thicker, I can make it vibrate at a lower frequency, which, which you think would be a way to make a low note. The trouble, though, is I, if I get down here, I have to make the steel string so thick that it wouldn't be a string anymore. It'd be like a, a vibrating bar, and that would not make a good piano. So, the, and, and, and in physics terms or in mechanical engineering terms, there would be too much stiffness in that string or that bar. So what piano makers do, in fact this was invented before pianos were invented for other instruments, is they take a steel core of a string and they wind copper around it. So think, imagine a steel core, a, 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 say a millimeter t a diameter steel string with a slinky round around it. Okay? So that slinky gives it extra mass, so it vibrates slower, vibrates at a lower frequency, but as you know from slinkies, they're very flexible. So you're add, you've added mass without increasing the stiffness very much. And these are called wound strings, and this is the way all, all bass strings and all pianos are made. And, and, to, with, and some of them actually have either two or even three windings around them to give you extra mass without, without giving you too much extra stiffness. And that's how you that's how we violate Pythagorean scaling uh, on, a, on a piano. Okay. Now, I mentioned, so we need the wound strings to increase the mass per unit length, but we want to do that in a way that minimizes the string stiffness. Now, this is a physics talk, so I get to show some equations here. And what I'll show you is that it, for a perfectly flexible string, this physicist ideal, the, the fundamental frequency is some, what, is some value set by the tension and other things in its length. But it will also vibrate at other higher frequencies called harmonics. And they, they, the frequencies of the harmonics for, follow a harmonic sequence where just the frequency of the nth harmonic is n times the frequency of the fundamental. Okay? So, that's, that's, so that's what perfect strings would do. Now, if I have a stiff string, you, well, you can ignore, well, physicists can look, there's a new term that comes on here that's a fourth derivative. If you're not a physicist, don't worry about it. The idea is this, if I have, for a, for a very, very flexible string, the only thing that, when I say I pluck it or I get it into motion, the thing that brings it back is the tension in the string. The tension gives you the restoring force that causes the wave motion. Now, if I have, any real string has a little bit of stiffness, right? If I bend a piece of steel, it springs back by itself. So that extra springing back force is a stiffness force, and that will act to increase the frequency of vibration. Now it turns out that it will increase the frequency of vibration more for the higher harmonics than for the low harmonics, basically because the high harmonics have a shorter wavelength, so they're bent more. Okay? So what happens is, the, uh, you, instead of getting this pure uh, harmonic relationship, you get a, a little devi a deviation from it that depends upon the harmonic number. So the second harmonic is 2 times F1 plus a little bit, and the third harmonic is 3F1 plus a little bit more, and so on. Okay? And, these are, and so because they aren't harmonic anymore, they're actually, these are actually called partials. So if you have a conversation with your piano technician, she will refer to them as, as partials, if she's taken my course. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a measurement of, the, of, of how big that effect is for my piano, my, my, uh, my grand piano. So this is for the note A3. This is the A below A440. <clears throat> and remember, for a perfectly harmonic set of frequencies, it would be F. 2F, 3F, 4F. So what I've done is I've taken the measured frequencies and divide them by N. So if it was perfectly harmonic, they would all fall at 220. So the first harmonic is 220 divided by 1. The second harmonic is, is about 440 divided by 2, brings me back and so on. So if this was a, harmonic, a truly harmonic sequence, every, every dot here would fall on this dotted line, a dashed line. But you see they don't. They go up higher, up more and more and more. That's the effect of string stiffness. Okay. And so this, and this shows you how, how big it is. It's typically a few hertz for the, the fifth or the sixth or whatever partial of this, of this note. 
Now, another way to measure that or to display it is in terms of a unit called, called sense. And this is not S-E-N-S-E, -E, as in your physics course, but C-E-N-T-S. It's a logarithmic unit. The important part about it is that 100 cents is the distance from one note to the next note above it, no matter where you are in the musical scale. So, so, just, so this, what, what this says is that, that, say, the sixth harmonic is about 10 cents too high, or about one-tenth of the way to the next note. So that gives you sort of a scale. So it's not huge, but it's, but it's quite noticeable in your perception. If you, can, you can construct either pianos or you can construct artificial tones that have no stiffness and compare them to one with this stiffness and you can tell the difference. And, and judging from the results of listening tests, humans prefer a little bit of stiffness. It, gives, it makes the, the note a little more interesting in the, in the way that a, a piano tone is different and I think more interesting than say the tone from a pipe organ. Okay, they're a little different tone color, a little different tam timbre. Now, this also, besides affecting the timbre of a single note, this also affects the way pianos are tuned. So this is an effect called octave stretching. And here's what happens. Okay, when, when your piano tuner gets to your piano, she tunes, say, A4, A, say A2 to A to be a certain frequency. And then she wants the next, the note, the next octave up to sound good when those two notes are played together. So what she will do, mine was a she, is a she, uh, is she will to adjust the, the, the note, the A, an octave higher, so that its fundamental coincides with the second harmonic of the lower frequency. So I, I have A at, say, 220. It has a second harmonic that's a little above 440. So she will take A440 and make it a little bit higher than 440. Otherwise, they wouldn't sound good together. Okay? So what she's actually done is made an octave, which should be a factor of two in, in pitch or frequency, a little more than a factor of two. And this is an effect called octave stretching. And every piano is tuned in this way, whether you knew it or not. Okay? An octave is not an octave. Okay? Okay? And this is an effect called octave stretching. It was first discussed a lot by a guy named Railsback uh, 70, 80 years ago. Okay? And what he did is he measured the tuning of lots of pianos. And then he, comp and he, he found they follow more or less on this, on this smooth curve. So all I've done is draw on this smooth curve. So this shows you that and what, what I've done here is I plotted the tuning of, the, of, a, of a typical piano across the keyboard range, from the low end up to the high end. And so over here, the scale is in cents. So this means that the lowest note on the piano is about 40 cents lower than it would have been for a perfectly harmonically tuned piano. And the high end is about 20 or 25 cents higher than it would have been. Okay? So in the middle, things are pretty good, not too much stretching, but there's a lot of stretching there's noticeable at the high end and a lot at the low end. This is now, there's no, I don't know if anybody who's actually calculated this curve, okay? But what this, this curve is, is for a typical piano, following this tuning curve makes the best sound. Now, best is a subjective uh, feeling, okay? But if you, so, but this is the way your piano at home is probably tuned, okay? In fact, if you, if you've ever seen your piano tuner tune your piano, she comes with a little tuning box. It's very, very smart now. And, and she'll punch in, oh, you have a Steinway M. She punches that in, and that tells you what curve to follow for the Steinway M. If you have a Bosendorfer, she'll, pick a, she'll put the Bosendorfer button on, OK? They're pretty smart, these engineers, right? OK, so this, this, is, a, this is an effect called octave stretching. It means that the octaves really aren't octaves, and this tells you that this, this, uh, there's one more thing I should mention. Just because your piano tuner makes the fundamental of the upper note match the second harmonic of the lower note, there's no way she can make the higher harmonics all match. Okay? So she's, she's, what she's doing is a grand compromise. Okay? That's, why I said the, that's, why, that's why I used the word best the way I, I, I meant to use it last a second ago. There's no ideal way, there's no way to make all the, oct all the harmonics of one note coincide with all the harmonics or the partials of the note below it. Never mind making chords and everything else, okay? So it's, a, again, a grand compromise. And this means that no chords will be perfect. No, no, chords will, no intervals will be perfect. No, already, no chords will be perfect. But this, this curve is, like I say, the grand compromise in how you tune a piano. Now, somebody might ask me, 
wait a second. They say, what about violins or if I'm, pl if I'm playing my oboe along with the, with the piano, how come my, my oboe can be perfectly harmonic and how can it play with something that's so terrible as a piano? And I don't really know the answer to that, but I think, I know, I think the answer is this. Most musical instruments, like your oboe or your singer or your clarinet or your trumpet, whatever, they only cover about two or two and a half octaves. And unless you get way into the bass, over any two octave range, things aren't so different than being flat. And I, I think this is how you get away with it, not being offended by the note of by when an oboe plays with a, with a piano. But I don't know for sure. I never, I've never done the experiments myself. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, about uh, let's move away from strings and start talking about other things, like the, like the hammer mechanism. I've already mentioned, this is my, again, my physicist's conception of the escapement. I just draw a little arrow here. I don't want to draw the whole thing. It's too complicated. I'll show you a picture in a second. But the idea is that we push the key lever. That pushes up on the hammer. The hammer is moving up to the string. Hits the, it, it comes loose. It, it, I'm sorry, it escapes from the action. That's why there's a gap here. And it hits the string. It forms a little wavelet or a little pulse. And that pulse, the hammer falls away. And the pulses, actually two pulses, travel in opposite directions. Okay? And, and then they go back and forth along the string. Okay? Now what's interesting is that, well this picture actually is not quite correct. Because this pulse here, this, this, the hammer hits the string cl pretty close to one end. And so th the, this pulse, the one that goes to the, the, play, the end closest to the player, will actually return first. And it will return before the hammer has actually fallen away. So it's not just a, a really quick pulse, but it's a longer pulse compared to that time for pulses to return. Oh, here's the picture of the action. This is not a very, this is hard to see from this photograph. All I want to uh, impress upon you is that it's very complicated. It's, 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 it's the most complicated lever I think any physicist has ever seen, okay? Or every, any physicist ever wants to see, okay? But it, and it, I don't know how to describe it other than if I show you a video, but I, I don't have that here. But I would mention that the piano action was, that we have today was designed oh, 150 years ago or so. And I think there are more patents for how to make a lever like this than any other patent with the piano. Okay? There, are just, there are just hundreds of patents. Like Everybody thinks they can make a better lever. Okay. Now piano hammers, uh, this is a picture of two hammers. This one's attached to the, to the hammer shank. This one's got the, sh the shank removed. These are, there's a scale, it's about two inches there. And this, these are basically uh, wooden or uh, felt covered wood, wooden mallets. Okay, the the core is made of uh, I think it's this looks like oak, and usually the shank is made of maple. And this is felt that's, that's wrapped very tightly around here. You see the this is the the treble hammer. It's smaller and weighs a, lot, a, a few grams. And this is a bass string hammer. weighs about 10 grams. It's much bigger. And but the way these are made is you, you get a piece of, of oak wood made in the shape of the, of the hammer uh, head. It's like, a, it's like a long piece, and you wrap the felt around it, and you cut it like a jelly roll. Okay? So you get one a, sort of a match set. Now, Cristofori didn't have the technology to make felt this way. I mean, felt was known then, but you couldn't make it in, in a reproducible way. His hammers were made very differently. Soon after Cristofori, uh, people started making hammers with, with leather coverings. And so early ones were made with leather until the felt technology caught up. And I, I, have, you know, I have a lot of pianos with leather hammers. And it's, what's remarkable is the leather hammers sound an awful lot like felt hammers. Okay? And I can talk more about that. I can talk more about all these things for much longer if you want to hear it. And I can talk more about that later if you want to, want to know. So that's what a hammer, piano hammer looks like. And you've probably seen them if you looked inside your piano. Now, let's talk about a little bit about piano hammers and piano strings. And this, this, this title should really be, How Should a Piano Hammer Be Modeled, Not String? Now, as physicists, we know about, well, the piano, let me back up. The piano hammer, this is a very bad sketch of a piano hammer. The idea is this is the hammer, this is the head of the hammer hitting a string. And the ham, hammer head comes up, hits the string, and the hammer, the felt compresses a little bit, hits the string, and then bounces back. Now, as physicists, we're all taught, it's, it's ingrained in our, in our psyche, that everything that compresses is a, is, a, is a spring, is a linear spring. I mean, that's what, I mean, I'll ask Paul, every course we, we, we take, it's linear springs, okay? So our, our, our first reaction is to model this, or mathematically, as a linear spring means that the force from the hammer is purpo directly proportional to the compression z, 
That's what I mean by a linear spring. And if those of you taking physics courses, you probably have nightmares about this too. Okay? <laughs> now, if I, were a, if I were to try to model a real piano hammer as a linear spring, it would fail miserably. Okay? It doesn't, it's not linear at all. And in fact, if it was a linear spring, it would be a disaster for the piano. It would be absolutely a disaster. So let me first tell you what they, how they behave, and I'll explain why it would be a disaster. Here is a plot, something we measured in my lab, we measured the hammer force as a function of the compression. And a typical, for a typical hammer below the compression is maybe half a millimeter, maybe a little bit more. And what you see is it's not linear at all. It's got a lot of curvature, and that curvature is described approximately by about a cubic law. And some hammers are z to the 2.5, some are z to the 4. So there's, no, there's no fundamental number there, but it's a lot bigger than 1. Okay? And what that means is that at the higher compressions, the hammer is effectively stiffer than at the low compressions, where it's effectively soft. Okay? So if I play a note with a, a, a very gentle key press and only press the, get the hammer going a little bit, I'll only use the soft part of the hammer characteristic. If I press hard and play a loud note, I'll get the, loud, the, the harder part of the characteristic. And if you think about it, that's exactly what we want from a musical instrument. I said before that this is the pianoforte means soft loud. I really meant more than that. When I play a loud note, I want the tone color to change besides not just the volume. I mean think about it. You could you could be playing a, a music a music in your on your in your car off your MP3 player or whatever and you can turn you can be listening to piano music and you can turn the volume way down. You can still tell when the piano is being played loudly as opposed to being played soft because you hear the change in tone color. Right, the way I think about it, if, if I'm playing the piano in one room, my wife's listening in, in, you know, in the basement, she can still tell when I'm playing loud or soft, not from the volume, but from the tone color. Right? Same thing is true for other instruments. Think about, say, a clarinet or a saxophone. Right? If I play a saxophone loudly, the tone color changes, a trumpet, right? all those things. The, to me, the key part about the expressiveness of an instrument is that the tone color changes when you change volume. It's not just a change in volume that makes it expressive, it's a change in tone color. Okay? And that's what, exactly what these nonlinear hammers do for the piano. In fact, people have looked at Cristofori's hammers. They are nonlinear with just about the same uh, exponent as, as a modern hammer. And this is why a leather hammer sounds just about the same as a felt hammer. They have about the same exponent. Okay? And this nonlinearity is essential. So th here's, my, here's my knock. I've, I've have, oh, I forgot to criticize physicists that have gone along. This is my knock on physicists. We, we, we are so obsessed with linear things that here the nonlinearity is an absolutely essential part of the instrument. It wouldn't be the same without the nonlinearity. Okay? So this is an example where making the physics too simple and assuming it's linear for simplicity, we, we miss everything impor that's important. Okay, so again, that's the, the note, the, the, uh, the message there. Now, let's keep going with this. Okay. This is, these are some measurements, again, on, our, on my, my Steinway piano, of a change in the tone color with volume. I promised you this. I'm going to show you now the real, the real measurements. So what I did here was I played the same note, uh, A440, at three different volume levels. Very loud, sort of medium, and very soft. And then I did an analysis, a spectral analysis of the, of the signal, and, I, and I'm plotting here the, the strength of the different components. So this is the partials, so the fundamental, partial number one, Second partial, third partial. Now, again, this is, I'm going to, again, I'm going to criticize physicists. When we draw our, our, our spectra in our physics classes, we think, we always think, or we tend to think, that the fundamental is the strongest, and then they get, they get weaker from there. Right? That's what we tend to, right, Paul? Right? 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 So, here, the soft note is indeed like that. The, 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 uh, the fundamental, the first partial, is the strongest, and then it gets weaker by about a factor of 10 in power, and another factor of maybe 100 in power. So it does get weaker as you go up in, up in frequency. But if you look at the loud note, the second partial is actually the strongest one. Okay? Now this is kind of amazing because we still hear this as the pitch of the, of the sound. Okay? But again, this, this wouldn't happen. This change in the curve wouldn't happen if we didn't have this nonlinearity change in tone color. So this, the change in tone color is not a small effect, it's a large effect. Okay? And this is not this is not just special for this particular note. I'll show you some more results in a second. 
this is, a, is an extremely important effect for many, many nodes. I mean, this is, this is A440. This is in the middle of the range. And as we're going to see, it gets, work, well, it gets better as you go down to the, in the base. Okay? Okay. So let's talk more about, about this. Uh, I'm, doing time. I'm doing fine on time. So uh, let me just come back and make a, couple, a quick comment about uh, something I, I mentioned quickly, but I, I, I passed on over too fa perhaps too quickly, too fast. This is a picture again of that, of that thing of the, the little wavelets going away from the hammer. And I mentioned the hammer hits the string, it generates wave pulses that go in opposite directions. And the first wave pulse, the one that hits, hits the close end, comes back, well, as you know from physics, it hits this end and it gets inverted. Right? Even if you haven't had a physics course, you know when you, play, when you play jump rope on, well, you don't do that anymore, but when you have a rope vibrating, you know if a, if a wave hits the end of a string, it comes back inverted. So this pulse comes back upside down and hits the hammer. And when it does that, the hammer is still in contact with the string, and so it causes a large recompression of, this ha of the hammer and back and forth and back and forth. So this, this is a picture of the hammer force on the string as a function of time. So when I play the note, this is when the hammer hits the string, and then you get all these vibrations up and down, up and down, as these wave pulses go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, between the short end and back to the hammer. So in terms of, uh, who, who here is a double E? Anybody a double E? Okay, so you know that this, this is basically the excitation function of our system, and it's going to be this frequency content which gives us the tone color later. Okay? It's complicated, right? It's not easy, not simple. So as physicists, I would tend to draw a sort of a simple, smooth curve, but again, I would be wrong. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing my own discipline, but that's okay. So if you want to model a piano sound, you've got to take this into account. And, and we know how to do that, but I probably won't have time to talk about it today. Okay, let's talk about another interesting problem. Where should the hammer strike the string? Sounds simple. You, oops, you see here that I've got this hammer is pretty close to one end of the string. And if you, go to, if you look at my Steinway or look at most modern, ha modern pianos, the hammer strikes the string about one-seventh or one-eighth of the way along from one end. Okay? Now, why is that important? It's important because of this. Those partials are different, what are called vibrational modes, vibrational patterns of the string. And the lowest partial is, the, is sketched here. The string just goes up and down together. It's a standing wave. You've probably all seen that, or many of you have. The second partial looks like this. Parts of the string go up and down and up and down. And the center has what's called a node in the center. There's no motion here at the middle. And the third harmonic looks like this. You get, I, well, I might run out of arms. But it's up and down in different ways. And you get two nodes. Now, the point is this. If I, suppose I hit the string with the hammer right there, right in the middle. There's no way I can excite this, kind, this mode. Right? I'm hitting it at the, in, the, in the place where it doesn't have any, any amplitude. So if, I hit the, if the piano hammer were to hit in the center, it could not excite the second harmonic, the second partial. Okay? In fact, who here is a guitar player? Okay. Have you ever tried to find the center of the guitar string with your eyes closed? Okay, you have? Okay, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell everybody else how to do it. If you close your eyes and you pluck the string in different places, when you pluck it at exactly the center, all these even har harmonics go away. And the tone color changes in a way you can hear. Do you know the answer? Do you know it? Okay, okay. He's an honest man up here in front. So, but the point is, by listening to the tone color, you can tell when the, the second and, and fourth and so on harmonics are present or not present. And likewise, if I pluck the string here, one-third of the way, or two-thirds, I will not generate the third and the sixth and so on. So this, by where you hit the string determines, again, part of the t a picture of the tone color. So for the piano, if you strike the string at the one-seventh of the way out, you won't generate the seventh and the fourteenth and so on harmonics. So, and this, this, this plot's going to show that. But let me just say before I go any farther, I have no idea why eliminating the seventh harmonic makes a better piano tone. People, somebody's decided that that's a good thing. That you don't want the seventh or the eighth harmonics. That's a matter of perception and how we think about the word best again. But that's, that's the way pianos are made nowadays. Okay? Christophorus piano was actually different, <coughs> but uh, modern pianos are all pretty uniform, and that, that it's about the one-seventh point for all the strings. So if you look at your piano, you'll see that the strike point is designed very carefully. <coughs> anyway, here's a plot that shows some of that. 
to see this carefully, I, what I did was I actually took the spectrum of the lowest note on the piano, A0, low, very lowest note. And this is, the, this is actually the power at different frequencies as a function of frequency. So every peak here is one of the partials. And you can see that there's a, it goes up and there's a big dip here. That's about the eighth partial. And there's another dip around the 16th partial. It's not perfectly clean, right? We're, engin we're engineers here, not physicists. But it, you can see a definite pattern that it goes down around 8, around 16, around 24, and so on. So this, this is, again, showing you this effect of the strike point. Okay? So again, where the hammer hits the string it has a big effect on the, the tone color. Okay? There's actually another, another effect I want to show from this plot. If you look down here, you see that the peaks down here get pretty weak, down, getting down toward the fundamental, down the lowest partial. So let's blow that up and look at that a little bit more. Okay, it's the same, it's the same plot on the left that I showed just now. And now I've blown up this lower part to right here. So this is, the, this is the spectrum at the low frequency end of the lowest note on the piano. Now I will, I will tell you, that's where the fundamental is. Okay? I don't see it either, okay? There's the second partial. You've got a little, a little guy there, and then third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And you can see that some of the highest, biggest partials are the sixth and so partials. So these, are the high, these are the stronger partials, and the fundamental is basically missing. Okay? Gone. Okay? Now, this is an effect that was actually understood and recognized by Helmholtz, a very famous physicist, also very famous in terms of his... Uh, Physiology, I mean, he invented the instrument that, that, that eye doctors use to look into your eyes. It's still used today. Okay? Very, very clever guy. Oh, yes. Very clever guy. And he understood this, uh, that it was missing. And then he asked, okay, why is it missing? How? And, well, here's the real mystery. Okay? The fundamental is missing. Okay, so what? I don't care. But, when you li so, but the real question is this. When I listen to this note, I hear the pitch as being this pitch, this 27 hertz. I don't hear it being 55, or this, or this, or this. You might have thought that the, that the apparent pitch would be the pitch of the, of the strongest harmonic. But it's not. It's the pitch of this guy who's missing. So somehow we hear the pitch that isn't even there. That's the mystery. And it's called the, it's called the missing fundamental, that's what it's called. And, the, and the, uh, the idea that Helmholtz put forward, which is basically still believed today, with, with some important modifications, is this. When you li okay, here's a, here's a very, here's, now we're back to the physicist schematic of a, of a spectrum. You can, you can make a spectrum like this, where this is the power as a function of frequency. So I can, no fundamental power, but I get power 2f, 3f, 4f, 5f. So what Helmholtz pointed out was, he said, look, these, these partials are separated by f1, the, the, the value of the fundamental. So maybe what your ear is doing is some kind of sophisticated uh, spectral analysis which actually, and, and assigns the pitch to be the difference between these frequencies and not the fundamental, not the lowest value. And for low notes, that seems to be a pretty good explanation of most experiments. There, there are some, people are still doing experiments on this today with people, but how we perceive tones. But that seems to be to explain what's happening. And this explains the, the, the mystery of the missing fundamental. Actually, the mystery, well, the two mysteries. The first mystery is why we perceive this to be the pitch. And I kind of explained that. Well, Helmholtz has kind of explained it. But the other mystery is why is it missing in the first place? Why don't I get, why is there no power in that, in, at that frequency? Why, why did my piano, my good piano I paid so much money for, why didn't it give me anything at this, at this you know, did I, did I get short change with the low notes? What happened? Okay. So that's the second mystery I want to talk about uh, I will get to, okay? And before, I get, before I can explain that, I have to talk a little bit about soundboards. Remember the soundboard, the, 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 the far end of the string is attached to the soundboard. When the string vibrates, the soundboard is pushed up and down. It acts like a big speaker. So let's talk about this. That. Let's talk about that big speaker. The soundboard is a piece of spruce. You can't really see it here. It's, it's hidden under the strings. Uh, but it's, it's the same kind of wood that makes the top plate of a guitar or the top plate of a violin. It's a little thicker for a piano, but it's basically the same wood. This spruce is, well, is, is, the, is the wood of choice for this because it's got a very high elastic constant called the Young's modulus. And in fact, the ratio of the Young's modulus to the density is a figure of merit for these kinds of vibrating woods. And the, and the, the figure of merit for spruce 
is just as good or even a little better than steel. Okay. So it's, it's, it's excellent for this purpose. And this is, the soundboard is, made, is put together this way. It's a piece of spruce. This is the top, looking at the top with all the strings and everything taken out of the piano. If you look carefully, you'll see grain running this way. And what happens is there are pieces of spruce that are, that are perhaps maybe six inches wide, depends on the quality of the piano, that are glued together edge to edge, and they run from lower right to upper left. Then on top of that is glued the bridge of the piano. That's where the strings are attached. Remember, this is the, the front of the piano where the, the keys would be. And the strings attach or go over the bridge like they do like for a guitar, say. This is the bottom side. The spruce is typically oh, half an inch, five inches of an inch thick, so it's pretty thin. And so to give it extra strength in this across the grain direction, there are ribs on the bottom, and that's what the ribs look like from below. Okay? So this is, this is a complicated enough uh, thing that it's not, too, it's not trivial to model. In fact, I won't, I won't embarrass Paul or anybody here by asking this question, but I'll just pose it. How many, how many independent elastic constants are there to describe the, the vibrations of a single piece of wood? Okay, the answer is, what? He said, two. Well, you're off by an order of magnitude, Paul. You're a physicist, okay? It, wood has 27 different elastic constants. Young's modulus, uh, Poisson's ratios, all these things, okay? So wood is, you, th you think physics is complicated. You think electrons are complicated, right? Wood is complicated, okay? <laughs> So, uh, so it's, it, but, but it can be managed. I mean, we, we know this thing. I'm, I'm sorry to make fun of Paul all the time. Okay. So let's talk about, about uh, soundboard. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Talk about that. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about the, the, how the soundboard vibrates. Uh, this is my cartoon of a soundboard. The lowest frequency, you can ask, like the string had a, had a, had a fundamental frequency. That was lowest frequency. It was, it was the, gave you the pitch of the note. That was the, the fundamental frequency. The sound boards or things like plates also have, a, uh, have different vibrational modes. And the lowest vibrational mode is called a breathing mode. Just like the way when you breathe, your chest goes out and in and out and in. And that's what I'm trying to show here. This sound board just goes out and in. That's the lowest um, vibra vibrational mode of the sound board. The frequency of that mode depends upon the size of the soundboard. For a large grand piano, it might be, say, 75 hertz. Okay? So it's toward the low end of the piano, but not, but not all the way. Then the second harmonic, or second, actually, we're not really harmonic. The second mode is a different mode where, like, if I, I can't do this, but my chest goes out, in and out, out of phase like that. that. That's the second mode. I tried to draw here. And then you get other modes that are more common. You get a third mode and so on. Okay? And these modes, they're, they're precise. Modal shapes depend upon where the ribs are and the bridges, and it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. But the most important thing to realize is, are two things. First of all, the soundboard, the lowest frequency is about 75 hertz. And that's important because if I try to make something vibrate at a frequency below its lowest vibrational frequency, it won't move very much. Okay? So you, you just can't, you, it's very hard to make the soundboard vibrate at frequencies well below 75 hertz. So that's one reason why the, uh, the fundamental is missing. At 27 hertz, that's way below this 20, 75 hertz. It's a couple of octaves below. It just doesn't want to vibrate. So even though I might have a lot of force from the string, the soundbar won't move very much. Okay? So that's one reason why the fundamental is very weak or even missing. Another reason is that the soundboard is too small to create a, frequency, a, a, a tone with a frequency that low. The, again, double E's, raise your hand. Okay, who's, have you learned about antennas? No, you guys don't learn about antennas anymore, do you? Okay. Okay. Well, if you learned about antennas, you would know that, in general, a good anten an, an, an antenna structure that's good for a certain frequency has to have a size that's comparable to, to maybe half the wavelength of that, uh, that radiation. Okay. Who's, who's the guy? Uh, I won't look. I keep looking. I can't find people. Okay, so the... the, free, the, the uh, the wavelength for the frequency is 27 hertz is, a, is more than 10 meters, maybe 15 meters. So it's much, much bigger than the soundboard. So the soundboard is a tiny little thing compared to the frequency it's trying to radiate, compared to the wavelength it's trying to radiate. And that's the other reason why the, the fundamental is so weak or even missing. Okay. So, so I've explained to you why the fundamental is missing, uh, and that's good. Okay, now, to get ready for the next, next part, the soundboard vibration, again, it's, it's, let's consider the breathing mode. Okay? So if I look at the breathing mode, 
the soundboard's going out and in and out and in. But if I look at a particular point on the bridge, I didn't draw a bridge here, but you can imagine that a particular point that's off center a little bit won't be measuring, moving just out and in, it'll also be rocking a little bit as the soundboard goes, right? Be, right? As my chest goes out, a place off center will rock a little bit to the side. Okay? And that'll be important because when the string is attached to that point, the end of the string won't just move out and in, it will also rock a little bit. And in physicist language, what that will do, okay, let me skip this. Oh, okay, I've been skipping, I've been too excited, I skipped a lot. Okay. Well, hang on, let me just show one thing. Uh, this, again, equations. I, I need to show equations for the mathematical physicists here. Uh, in physics, we're used to dealing with second order partial differential equations. Okay? I don't know if, I've ever, if I'd ever seen a fourth order differential equation in physics until I started looking at pianos. Okay? We just don't see them. Okay? But who are the civil engineers here? Raise your hand for civil engineers. Come on, raise your hand. Okay? Civil engineers see all this. This is thin plate theory, it's called. It's been around for hundreds of years. Okay? So engineers do have something on physics once in a while. Okay? But if you, want to, if you want to model the vibrations of sound boards, you're going to have a very uh, anharmonic kind of structure. And, and, the, and the different the elastic constants come in in complicated ways. I can talk about later if you, if you like. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, let's talk about uh, piano tones and how they, how they decay with time. So these four plots show four different notes. Let's see. This uh, upper left is, is the lowest C on the piano. And then we go up a couple of octaves, C3 over here. This is C6. And this is the highest C on the piano. Now what I've done is the time scale is the same for all these plots. And so it's clear that the low notes last a lot longer than the high notes. And this one only ended because I, I, I stopped the, the note. I put the damper down. Okay? So you can see right away that the, the high notes decay quickly. The low notes last for a long time, which you already knew when you play your piano. Now the reason for that, technically, it has to do with the, uh, the effective impedance. You can talk about imp impedances for the string and the soundboard and how they are the same or different. Okay? So that's a, that's a detail I don't want to go into. Instead, I want to look at the details of this decay. So what I'm going to do next is plot this decay, but in a different way. I'm going to actually look at the instantaneous amplitude as a function of time. So I'm going to, this thing's going up and down like crazy. I'm going to take that away and just look at the amplitude versus time. And it looks a lot simpler. Okay, it looks like this. So that's the same curve, but now I'm just plotting amplitude versus time. And you can see that it decays. This is a, a semi-log plot. So logarithm over here, or uh, log scale on the left and linear scale for the horizontal. And it decays roughly like one curve here and then a different straight line here. And this is, this is called a double decay, really very profound name. And what it, but it definitely means that two different things are happening. Some, something early, the, the decay is, 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 has one characteristic or one character early and then a different one later on. And what's happening is this. Well, let's sketch here. Here's, again, the, 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 ham, the string, the string runs from you, the player, to the back of the piano. The hammer hits the string, and the string's vibrating in this plane. Okay? Now, that, that direction of string vibration gets the soundboard moving a lot. So you get a lot, of a lot of sound generated, and the string dies away relatively quickly. But as the, as the soundboard is vibrating, it has this rocking motion. So the end of the string is moving up and down, but also rocking to the side a little bit. So that means you start the string vibrating in the horizontal plane. So what started out as this kind of vibration ends up meaning being a horizontal vibration. Now the horizontal vibration doesn't move the soundboard very much. Right? The soundboard doesn't want to move. And so it decays much more slowly. So what you've done is converted, in, in technical language, physics language, you've converted from one polarization, the vertical one, to the horizontal one. Okay? And, so, and now, what that does is it means when you play your piano tone, it dies away quickly at first, but then it will linger for a long time. So if you're playing, I don't know, some Chopin or whatever, and you have these long passages, you have that availability there, which you wouldn't have if the thing just decayed away all the way quickly. Okay? So this is this is so the piano the decay of, you know, is a little more complicated than you might have guessed as as your physicist okay as a physicist now it gets now this this is the de decay for that lowest note on the piano that has oh I didn't mention it, it has only a single string creating the note as you go I forgot to mention this earlier I should have I I got too excited as you go up in the piano keyboard some notes have two strings as you may know and some even have three 
So let's show the same kind of behavior, but now we're going to look at a, at a note that's created by two strings. And what you see is this. You get, you get a fast decay at first, and then you get a slow decay, but you kind of get this oscillation. And a physicist would recognize this as, well, as a, a sort of a beating effect. So what ha what's happening here is, when you first hit the string, I mean, sorry, when the hammer hit, first hits two strings, they both go up and down together, and they decay a lot. And then they eventually make this decay, but they start beating against each other. They get out of phase because they don't have quite the same frequency. And so for a while they're in phase, and then they're out of phase, and then they're in phase. So this is, this is the effect called beats. So, and you can imagine if I, if I have three strings, it gets more complicated. For a physicist, this is very similar to having two modes that are coupled with some, some weak perturbation. It's, it's very similar physics. You can write it down. Okay? But this again, now this, why is this important? Well, you, if you listen to a piano tone, you can really hear this because sometimes you'll hear, you play a note and it lingers on and you hear kind of a little bit of a vibrato. Okay? That's where it comes from. And, that may, and as you probably know, if you listen to your violin friends play violin, they're always adding vibrato. A little bit of vibrato is a good thing, right? Just ask your violinist friends. Okay? And that's, what's, that's where you get it here, just from a single note. Okay? So, they're all... Okay. How are we doing on time, Paul? Like I said, I, I, I'm done. I, I forgot where I was in my talk even. Sorry. So let's, let's, let me just summarize and sort of recap some of this. On the face of it, a piano is a very simple thing, right? What can be simpler than a vibrating string, okay? But there's a lot of physics that, that's involved here. String stiffness is very important. It, it affects tone color in harmonicity. It affects the way a piano is tuned. Remember the octave stretching effect, right, are crucial to how, how a piano sounds. The hammer, hammer nonlinearity is perhaps the most important part about the piano. It's, it's what makes it expressive. This is the part that Cristofori really understood even 300 and some years ago. Uh, the interaction between strings leads to this very interesting time decay, which isn't just a curiosity, but it's really important. Again, it gives this vibrato effect, which has make, really gives the, the tone an extra richness, which, which we all like to hear. Uh, the bass notes you know, are, are a puzzle, are, are, are a surprise. No fundamental, but we still hear the same pitch. So again, we see how the importance of, of us, the listener, in the whole, in the whole business. Uh, and it's, which is what I mean by when I say psychoacoustics plays a major role in, in how we perceive tones and how the piano is made. So to me, the bottom line is this. There's a lot of interesting physics in your piano. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick, for a, a glorious tour of the physics of the, of the piano. Uh, I think we now all know why in 2004 the uh, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching found Nick to be the uh, Professor of, of the Year for the State of Indiana. Uh, you, okay. you were right. Thank you. Um, I should also mention that your admonishment that we think nonlinearly uh, fits very well at Georgia Tech, which is the home of the Center for Nonlinear Science. So we welcome your well, advertisement. If, if people who know me know that I love to criticize engineers and chemists, but I think sometimes physicists deserve it too. I, okay. Perhaps you're right. <laughs> I think we have time for a few questions if there are any. Uh, now that uh, you seem to be able to encapsulate the piano in equations, I think there's a lot of uh, money to be made by taking these equations and producing a piano that is one tenth of the size. Uh, the question was, why don't we make a piano just out of our computers rather than out of anything else, right? No, so, no, sorry. I don't mean a synthesizer. Okay. I mean a real instrument. You want a nanoscale piano. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's certainly possible, and companies like Yamaha are doing things in that direction. Uh, not, not quite as much as, as you're thinking of. The, uh, no, I, wouldn't viol I would never violate a physical law. I would never think of doing that. Um, well, I'll just say one interesting thing. I mean, I, you, you raise a very interesting point, but I'll just say one, one comment about that. Um, Yamaha makes some very interesting uh, uh, um, pianos that aren't acoustic pianos, but they're, they're basically make sounds in, in, you know, based on, on synthesis or other things. And what, what's interesting to me is the latest ones, they work very hard to give the 
to give the key lever, give the action the same feel as a real piano, even though it's not needed to do that. What they also do is they have vibrators built into the piano, so the, vi so the case vibrates the way an acoustic piano would, even though it has nothing to do with the way they create sound. So that all they're doing is, making it is, is trying to fool you into thinking it's a real piano. So they decided that it's important to fool the player to make him or her comfortable. Okay? So it's, it's like we have our ideal piano in our heads and we're never going to let it go even though we don't need these other things. Okay? So, I don't, so maybe the piano is locked into place and it will never, some of the parts of it will never change. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. No, I didn't, I didn't say it was an answer to your question. I was just making some comments. That's my prerogative, right? <laughs> Why do they go from leather cover, hammer coverings to felt hammer coverings? Uh, I, 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 you know, I collect pianos, uh, and I have a lot of pianos with leather covered hammers. Uh, and it's amazing that the leather made 200 years ago is still very good. I think, the, I think the chemical way it was made was different 200 years ago than it is now, and it, it lasted longer. I think the reason is that felt was ultimately more durable when you had higher tensions and, and, bigger, and bigger strings. I think the leather does wear out, uh, although, again, I have panels that have nice leather coverings and work well. I think it's just a qu question of durability. Once the string tension got up, and you, it was harder to hit them. They wear out faster. You had a question over here? Okay. Yeah, I, I do. I, I, well, I didn't, we're not set to play them. But they're on my website. Yeah, no, we did that. I mean, we made a whole, comp a whole piano based on you know, pushing the key lever and calculating. So the calculation involves this nonlinear hammer hitting the string and, and, and taking into account that complicated waveform I showed you. And then the string's vibrating and it gets the soundboard moving. And we calculated the vibrations of the soundboard. We did that uh, with all the elastic constants and things. And then coupling that soundboard motion to the air and creating this, you know, the acoustic pressure you hear. So go to my website and you'll hear some sounds. What can the performer do? Well, it's funny. My piano teacher used to always talk to me about how I push the key down after, after the hand. And I don't believe that. I mean, I just don't believe it. But, but certainly, uh, expressiveness. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is just, is, is just certainly in how hard you hit, push the keys and things. There's been some really interesting uh, uh, studies of, of real per piano performance. And a lot of it is in timing and having, the, having the, the note come a little early or a little late, and those, you've probably seen those. I mean, not just Chopin-type rubato, but other things too. And so that's a big part of it. In fact, the way you make a harpsichord uh, sound more interesting is by, even though the notes are all the same volume, is by, by the timing. So there's a lot of, a lot of that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a great player, so you shouldn't ask me all that question. Okay. <laughs> yes? This was all the classic grand piano, but there's also the uprights and squares and other styles. Do they have... Same physics, or is it just the same keyboard? It's basically the same physics. He, he, the question was about about uh, square. You mentioned square pianos and then grand, and then uprights. Um, square piano. Well, the, the earliest pianos were made in the shape of harpsichords, which had this wing shape we've already seen. But there was also an instrument at the time. I'm, this is for everybody else. You already know this. At, the, at that time, there was an instrument called the clavichord, which was not square but rectangular, and the 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 uh, little ones were uh, sort of, oh, about this big on the table and maybe this big around. Okay? And, and they had the strings running sideways as opposed to front to back. And they were basically the household instrument. So when Mozart would go to give piano lessons to somebody, they would probably play a square piano in that house. And, they were, and the ones in Mozart's time were some, I could pick it up. It's very light and everything else. I couldn't really carry it, but I, it's that small. Uh, things are basically the same for that. Um, the bigger change was when they went to uprights. Now, the square pianos, uh, they had the same thing happen to them that happened to grand pianos. You wanted to add more and more notes. So the earliest squares were like four, four octaves. And then they started adding bigger and bigger. I have, a, I have a Steinway square that dates from 1858 that has seven octaves. And it weighs, I think it weighs a ton. I mean, it's, it's, the, I mean, it was, it's huge. It's, got, it's, it's, it's very massive. And it wasn't a very good household instrument okay, anymore. At the same time, in the early 1800s, the technology for uprights was invented, and what was real, the key to that technology was the action. 
right? The action, I didn't talk much more about it, but the action for a grand piano and for a square, the hammers come up from below, hit the strings, and fall back. So you have gravity working for you. For the upright piano, the hammers hit the string this way and you have to bounce back. So you've got levers and keys and all kinds of things. And it took a while for people to invent a good action. And it was about 1820 or so when the, the, the action that basically is all upright today was invented. And after that, the square started to go away. So, but the physics is, so the main physics difference is in the action as opposed to anything else. Back in the back there? I've never looked for that. The, the thinking in musical acoustics is that the phases don't really make much difference. That the phases of, of one partial to the next. So we usually ignore that. Yeah, I've never studied that, but that's, that's, what, people, that's what, what people think. More questions? Yes? Oh, you want another talk about that? <laughs> the, the question was this. Let me repeat the question in case people hear it. I mentioned this business about octave stretching, and I talked about octaves being a factor of two. But there are a lot more ratios that go into a musical scale than just a factor of two. Now, where do I start? Jeez. Uh, the way we tune pianos today is, in a, is, a, is a method called equal temperament, which means there, there are basically 12 notes that span the octave. And so we go 1 12th of the way so across the octave for each note, but one twelfth of the way in a, in a logarithmic sense, okay? So the ratio of C sharp to C is two to the one twelfth, and, and D to C sharp, another two to the one twelfth, and twelve two to the one twelfths, or whatever it is, make two, right? That's what it is. That's, that's equal temperament. Now, some people believe that equal temperament was the worst thing ever invented, okay? The, for the following reason. If I play the note C, and I play the note G, which is supposed to be a perfect fifth, or no, sorry, supposed to be a fifth. If, if it's a perfect fifth, then the ratio will be precisely three to two, sorry, or three to two, whatever, okay? And that will be a very nice, pleasing ratio in my ears, and I won't hear much beating other than the higher harmonic, higher partials. But the fundamentals won't beat. But equal temperament, two to the five twelfths divided by two is not three to two, okay? So, that, that interval, C to G, will beat when you listen to your piano. And some people, most of us, don't like that very much. Okay? So, okay, I'm going to make sure I get back to your question. Okay? Uh, so, by tuning an equal temperament, we give up the possibility of perfect intervals and making really beautiful intervals, beautiful, beautiful uh, chords. Okay? But what we gain is we gain the ability to play equally bad in any key. Okay? <laughs> Which some people believe is a good thing. Okay? Now you can sort of sense how I feel about it, but that's okay. okay? Uh, but equal, temper equal temperament was what was used up till about, it depends who you believe, at least Mozart's time, it started to change. And then maybe a little even a little later than that. Um, now, it's sort of the question of equal temperament versus, versus other temperaments gets, it's sort of a moot question for the piano. Because I've already showed you that even a single note isn't harmonic. And the deviations of a single note from being harmonic are about the same size as the deviations from temperaments between equal temperament and others. So, so I think tuning a, at least tuning a modern piano to equal temperament or to an unequal temperaments wouldn't really make much difference <laughs> in the end, okay? So I'm not sure I've answered, but, but the real reason is you can modulate keys and you can play it. You can play in F sharp minor as well as you play in C major, those kinds of things. And that makes it easy for playing other instruments and other things like that. But, but I mean, there, there have been many books written about, you probably know this, about temperaments, right? There have been. There have been many, okay? Yes? yes. Why is it, the, okay, well, I was speaking figuratively, okay? Uh, again, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, there are people who do lots of these things. I, I think I've read about people doing experiments where they play one note on one side and one on the other, and, they, and, and, and some of these harmonic relations get put together, not in your e single ear. And I think also people have done experiments. It's not a nonlinear effect. I mean, it's not just nonlinear mixing. I, I mean, if, as a double E, you might think, oh, this is nonlinear mixing, two, two, two partials mixed to give you F1. It's not that simple.
Okay? I think it is done at the higher order of parts, I think. But I, I, we can look it up, okay? But that's, my, that's what I seem to remember. Yes? Oh, I forgot to mention that. Okay, the question was, what about the low keys on the Bosendorfer? Why, why are they important? Okay, I got to show up. I have to show up back to my pictures. Okay, I don't actually own a Bosendorfer. I can't afford it. But uh, why do we do that? Um, okay, let's let's do it here. Uh, the lowest note is one of these bass strings. It's way along the edge of the soundboard. Okay, now. And it, it runs over the bridge close to the edge of the soundboard. Now, remember that breathing mode thing. If I'm trying to make the soundboard move and I'm pushing on it at the edge, that's not very good. Okay? So when I'm with the Bosendorfer, I did, for those of you who haven't seen the Bosendorfer, some of them have an extra, what, three or four notes on the, on the low end? How many is it? I don't know. It, it have, they have about four, about four notes even lower than the one on the Steinways or in, in every other piano. And they actually give them a different color so you, you, know, you, you don't get mis, uh, disoriented when you're playing the piano. Okay? But what they do, never mind if you use them or not, what they do is they make, it means the soundboard has to be even a little wider than this one, which means this lowest note is actually closer, to, farther from the edge, which is a good thing for it. So that's why, so I think adding those extra four or five notes in the Bosendorfer makes other notes better. They sort, of, they sort of sacrifice themselves for the good of the piano, right? Okay? <laughs> so I think. To me, that's, that's one of the most important things they do. So. We have time for just one more question, if there is one. Yes? Yeah, the keys that you described in action is uh, single degree of freedom. Is anybody ever played with you know, pedal action or something with, uh, say, just down on the key, <coughs> driving in and out? OK, the question was, has anybody ever tried to design a key where you could push not just down, but in and out? Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, there, there is a pedal on, the, on many pianos. It's called the, uh, what, the unicorda pedal. Where, have you seen that? Do you know about that? Okay, I'll tell, explain it. So some pianos, like, like most grand pianos, there's a, there's a lever, there's a, well, there's one, there's the one um, pedal you all know lifts the damper so the thing vibrates more and sounds sort of more resonant. But there's another pedal which shifts the entire keyboard all, all over a little bit. So instead of having a hammer hit three strings, or two strings, it's one, right? Una corda, that's where it comes from, right? And the idea there is that you get, a, you get it, first of all, you only have one string, so that changes the tone color a little bit. You also are playing with a different part of the hammer, which is probably a little softer than the part that's been, you know, been, been roughened up by all this playing. So that will change, so that's a little bit of what you're saying, but that's, that's the only thing that goes in that direction like that. Well, before we thank uh, Nick one more time, I'd like to mention that three weeks from tonight, in this club building, in this room, very nearby. John Mather will be visiting. John Mather is a Nobel laureate. He's visiting us from NASA, from NASA in Greenbelt, Maryland, and he has the characteristically modest title for a physicist, History of the Universe from the Beginning to the End. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> and now let's thank Nick one more time. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>